Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS uh, that uh, conducts our research for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Liam Fox, a uh, member of, Par of British Parliament for 22 years, uh, looking after the constituents of North Somerset. Many of us know Dr. Fox uh, as being the former Secretary of State uh, for Defense, uh, who was named by Prime Minister Cameron from 2010 to 2011. Um, and CSIS uh, claims Dr. Fox as one of our own uh, for coming last year for a conversation we held in Williamsburg, Virginia on the future of Europe. And I assure you that Dr. Fox gave us a very lively and spirited debate about what the future of Europe will look like, and I'm sure some of that will be reprised for us this morning. Uh, prior to uh, uh, former Secretary of State for Defense, Dr. Fox served as, as many shadow secretaries uh, while in opposition for health, for foreign secretary, as well as for Secretary of Defense. A general practitioner, Dr. Fox, can uh, also give us some insights on health and healthcare issues as they relate to the United Kingdom. I'm also delighted to welcome two guests with us. We have General Brent Scowcroft with us, former U.S. National Security Advisor, and Judge William Webster, former uh, FBI and CIA Director. We're delighted to have you both with us. And, and Dr. Fox, I think that gives you a sense of the importance that we uh, uh, subscribe to this conversation, and we look forward to your remarks. Dr. Fox will give us opening remarks, and then we'll transition into a discussion and welcome our audience uh, today for a lively Q&A on the future of the US-UK special relationship, but I think we'll have a, a broader conversation about the variety of international challenges we face. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Liam Fox. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here at CSIS. Uh, it is not a quiet time in global events. In fact, I can never remember a more turbulent time in global, global events, but what a better uh, time uh, to talk about the relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. In fact, when Winston Churchill first used the term special relationship, he did it during his speech in Fulton, Missouri, which is, of course, better uh, remembered for his use of the phrase Iron Curtain for the first time. But when Churchill spoke about the special relationship, he did so as a wartime leader. Uh, and it was basically an intelligence relationship, a military relationship. Um, the somewhat uh, Disney-esque, gooey-eyed connotations that special relationship gained in later years are not, for me, the, the concrete foundations that it has. This is uh, a relationship about our security in a dangerous world. And there are so many threats in this very interdependent world. And one of the changes that uh, Churchill uh, would have been astonished to see is the level of interdependency that we now have. And we have had so many warnings about just how interdependent we've become in recent years, whether it's the terrorist attack of 9-11, whether it's the uh, natural event of SARS, whether it's the Japanese tsunami, whether it's the 2008 banking crisis. What is very clear is that contagion in one part of the global economy will very quickly spread to the rest. In fact, the whole concept uh, of over there, I think, is a term um, that um, might become somewhat dated uh, as we go ahead. Um, when I was writing um, the book that I wrote about, uh, about global security threats at rising tides, um, it was pointed out to me that back in 1993, uh, not exactly a very long time ago, there were 130 websites in the world. At the end of last year, there were 654 million, uh, which is a whole change, a uh, quantum leap in information. But it's also a lot of terrorist haystacks uh, in which to hide terrorist needles. And that's something I want to come on to in a moment. But I, I wanted to set out the range, generic range of risks that we face before I come to some of the specifics but I set them as failing states, the ri rise of religious fundamentalism, the spread of transnational terrorism, financial imbalances, competition for commodities. And that's before we even got to the state-on-state -state threats um, that we face. 
And I began by setting out what the risks I thought were of failing states. And the one that I actually identified um, was Pakistan. And I said Pakistan not out of malign intent, but because of sheer instability. Uh, most of us politically uh, will be used to dealing with our opposite numbers. But in a country like Pakistan, where, frankly, we're never really sure who's in charge, whether it's the politicians, the military, or the ISI, we have to develop a whole range of relationships. And of course, from a British perspective, I was very interested as to why after 200 years of common history, India, after partition, went on to become a relatively stable, prosperous, uh, and increasingly middle class uh, economy, whereas Pakistan effectively rolled backwards uh, from the very beginnings, perhaps it's something we can discuss. But I was interested that uh, at partition, nobody knew what to call Pakistan because it didn't correspond to any natural, historical, or geographical entity. So in fact, it's an acronym. Pakistan was actually a made-up name, made up of the, the uh, initials of the provinces of Punjab, Afghania, Kashmir, and so on. Uh, and I think that it's a fair bet that if your country's name is made up, then it's not probably the most stable entity uh, that you're likely to see. And I say that, that this is a worry because here in Washington, with all the focus on Iran at the present time, people seem to have forgotten that Pakistan's sitting on something like 120 nuclear warheads and has recently brought into play uh, two new heavy water plants that will enable them to produce about 24 nuclear warheads a year from now on. It is the nuclear problem that uh, nobody seems to want to acknowledge and talk about in detail. Then, of course, we've got the rise of transnational terrorism. It's nothing new, uh, but it changes its manifestations. And of course, the, the worry that we have is that this nuclear proliferation in places like Pakistan will find its way um, into the terrorist game. And we, people say, well, if it's so easy to make a dirty bomb and there's so much fissile material out there, why have we not seen one? And yet, nobody seems to know that in 1995 in Ismailovsky Park in Moscow, um, the nuclear material was there, but it just wasn't attached to a bomb. Or that in Chechnya, we have had fissile material attached to, uh, to mines. So the threat is there, and it will increase. And we need to look at uh, uh, our whole issue of proliferation in light of the increased terrorist threat. We um, also need to understand some of the other risks that are coming from left field. And one of the ones that I constantly talk about is the risk of competition for commodities, and in particular, water. And people talk about China, uh, but they very often miss out one of the really important parts of the equation, which is that 48% of all the people alive on our planet today get their drinking water from a river that arises on the Tibetan plateau. So, why do you think China is so intent on Tibet? Tibet? Is it the Dalai Lama? Or is it the fact that it's the world's greatest resource in terms of fresh water? Unless we know the data, we will not make sensible uh, interpretations of events and therefore are likely to make uh, policy mistakes. The rise of religious fundamentalism, particularly Islamic fundamentalism, is there for us all to see. And we're facing this crisis now with ISIS, the latest manifestation of this, but I doubt if it will be the last manifestation of it. We need to be very, very clear about the threats that, that Islamic State pose to us. First of all, the humanitarian threat, the immediate threat to the population that live under their control. We've seen what they're capable of, beheadings, crucifixions, setting people on fire and, and for a video camera, things that we thought had been uh, violence, we thought had been left behind in the, the, the Middle Ages. The second threat, of course, the further destabilization of the region. They would love to see a full-blown religious war. This is, in fact, part of what they're trying to achieve. And then, of course, they will be the university of jihad if we allow them to do so. And they will export terror to uh, Western democracies if they get the opportunity. And we've seen cases in the United Kingdom of people who've gone uh, to fight for ISIS and then come home. Personally, I don't believe you can have a sabbatical from civilization um, and then come home. You know, no jihad gap year uh, that you can come back and say you're very sorry uh, that you did it. So we have to, again, think about the domestic problems. And then nuclear proliferation itself. Iran clearly 
the big issue. When Rouhani became president, there were so many in the Western commentariat who were describing it as a, a breakthrough, a new moment in the relationship. You know, big disappointment there. Uh, for the people of Iran, they've not really noticed much of a difference. The repression, the executions continue apace in Iran. And what people seemed to uh, fail to understand was that the shots are still called um, by the Supreme Leader. And if you read, there's a, a wonderful little book by uh, Karim Sanjapur from the uh, Carnegie Endowment uh, called Reading Khamenei. And he has a political consistency that most Western politicians would kill for. Um, the, uh, his belief in the purity of the Islamic Revolution, his hatred for the United States, his contempt for the existence of the State of Israel, all very, very consistent uh, over a long period. And I think it is absolutely unbelievable that people still will look at the evidence in front of them in terms of what Iran is doing in terms of its nuclear program and say, well, maybe they're not trying to achieve a nuclear weapons program. There is no possible uh, excuse for the levels uh, of, of uh, nuclear work that they're, they're doing and enrichment at the present time, other than that they're trying to get a nuclear weapons program. The clandestine way in which uh, Natanz uh, and, and Iraq uh, were developed says to me that this is not a country that is open about its intentions. And there is a problem here, a generic, generic problem in the West, which is that on too many occasions in recent times in foreign policy, we have allowed wishful thinking to take the place of critical analysis. Because we want something to happen, we have, we have used the data to try to make it look as though that is what's happening. And it's not happening in the case of Iran. And why should we worry about a nuclear Iran? Well, first of all, it does provide an existential threat to Israel with all the implications that that has for wider policy. Secondly, I think it would mean the NPT is not worth the paper that it's written on. And if uh, Iran gets to uh, nuclear weapon status, why should Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey not want to follow them? And that means a nuclear arms race in one of the most unstable regions of the world. And after all the work that was done, particularly in the United States at the end of the Cold War, to stop proliferation and to stop the former Soviet states being able to have nuclear weapons. Surely we want to leave something better to the next generation than a new nuclear arms race. This is a challenge for all of us. I worry about what is happening today in terms of the negotiations. Some say we need to get a deal. I actually think no deal is better than a bad deal. And what do I mean by a bad deal? I think any deal is a bad deal that allows Iran to become a threshold nuclear state because of the dangers that I've mentioned. I particularly worry that, uh, the, about the potential of a bilateral uh, agreement between the United States and Iran that doesn't come from the P5 plus one. We need to stand together in the face of international threat and not be divided. And I'm sure that's something we'll talk about in our wider conversation. And then uh, on this happy list of the threats we face, we didn't really think that we would be facing a state on state threat uh, to the extent that we're facing today from Russia. And if ever there was an example of wishful thinking displacing critical analysis, it is in Putin's Russia. Because we have so wanted Russia to become a useful partner in the international uh, family of nations that we have simply been turning a blind eye for too long. There are two basic principles followed by Putin which make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to normalize relations with Russia. The first is that Putin still clings to the idea, the old Soviet idea, of a near abroad. In other words, that he should have a veto over the policies of his immediate geographic neighbors. And we've seen of what that has led to in recent times. And the second is his concept that he believes that the protection of ethnic Russians lies not with the countries or the constitutions or the systems of law under which they live, but with an external power, i.e. Russia itself. And these two views are the root of many of the problems that we face. And we can see the manifestations of these today in Ukraine. Um, I do not believe 
that you can take Putin's word on any agreement when it comes to his borders. I think that what is happening in the Ukraine is truly shocking. The annexation uh, by force uh, of Crimea, the destabilization of the eastern borders of Ukraine, the fact that while NATO carries out normal military maneuvers and exercises, Russia is actually testing weapon systems live in eastern Ukraine from the, the book uh, miss anti uh, missile system to the Strela system. Uh, these are uh, real-time uh, um, testing that Russia is actually carrying out. And we are standing by and arguing about whether we should give the Ukrainians the means or not to defend their homeland. Just think about it. If we are actually saying we cannot give Ukraine the uh, secure comms or the anti-tank capability or the UAVs for targeting and surveillance that they need because that might exacerbate the crisis. That is a bully's charter. That simply says we will never, never give anyone uh, the means to defend themselves because that might make the aggressor even more angry. This is a ridiculous policy uh, for us to hold, and we need to recognize that the defense of the Baltic states, for example, begins in Ukraine. And we are only one miscalculation by Putin away from potentially getting an Article 5 involvement on continental Europe, and we need to waken up to it. We have been serial appeasers of Putin, and it has not got us very far. When he had a cyber attack on Estonia, we did nothing. When he cut off Ukraine's gas, we did nothing. He invaded Georgia, and he's still there, and we did very little. We made some sanctions uh, in response to what's happening in Ukraine and Crimea, but appeasement has a bad track record. It had a bad track record before. It's got a bad track record today. So why should we in the United Kingdom still look so much to the United States in an era of all these potential problems? Because you are the world's biggest economy, because you are the world's biggest military budget, bigger than the next 11 combined, uh, which is very reassuring um, when you are a close ally uh, of the United States. But more than that, we need to have a partnership of values because in all these problems that we face in the world, we need to understand that we are who we are, not by accident. We are who we are by design and by decisions that were taken by those who went before us. And we are built on the concepts, uh, both our nations, of our ability to exercise a free market, uh, our economic liberty in a free market. We understand the value in terms of prosperity and security in free trade. We understand the need for a rule of law applied equally to the governing and the governed independently. And we understand the concept of rights across race, religion, and gender. These are what make us who we are. And we need to take ownership of these, and we need to be expanding these in a very unstable world. And to my American political colleagues, I would say this. There has never been a time when we were more able to shape the world. In the era of globalization, we need to shape it in our image and, and by our own values. This is not a time for America to look inwards. This is not a time for America to become more isolationist. There has never been a time, I believe, where America was more needed on the pitch than it is today. And that's probably, I think, Heather, the best place to begin our conversation. Perfect, thank you. Well, thank you. That was, uh, that was wonderful, a great tour de force. Um, I think what we'll do, I'll spend a few minutes, uh, we'll have a conversation with us, and then I'll uh, turn you over to our audience. I will warn you that CSIS audiences are very tough. They ask very tough questions. So I'm a mere warm-up to what you're about to experience. But you gave us a, a broad tour de force. I think I'll focus a little bit more on Europe uh, in, our, in our questions. And let me start with Russia, since that's where you, you concluded. Um, uh, the murder of Boris Nemtsov. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a turning point? Will we see a different uh, environment within Russia? I think one of uh, Nemtsov's, uh, one of his most poignant remarks, literally days before his murder, 
was that he felt that there needed to be a Maidan in Russia, uh, an awakening in Russia, which in some ways I think is the, the most powerful threat to Vladimir Putin than to anything. Did you see the, these, these unbelievable images from, from Moscow, literally steps from the Kremlin? Did you see that? Do you see this as potentially a turning point for Russia? It's potentially, but again, given the level of control and repression that exists there, um, we've had these false dawns before. Uh, being a, a vocal opponent of Putin is not a safe uh, position to be in, as Litvinenko, <coughs> Nemtsov, Politskaya, you name them, of the very long list, the, the growing list uh, of, of enemies of the Russian president who have uh, been silenced. It would be nice to think that uh, we would get a change. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm just not that optimistic about it. Uh, you've uh, had uh, some conversation as recently as, as yesterday on BBC One Radio talking about the level of defense spending. Uh, very concerned about uh, British defense spending, the lack of a commitment to 2% of gross domestic product towards defense spending. I'd like to pull you out a bit on that and really uh, offer some reflections. Is NATO ready to confront Russia? We have seen extraordinary uh, military mobilization SNAP exercises. I saw a statistic that since uh, David Cameron has been prime minister, uh, Russia has uh, overflown or, or gotten very close to uh, air sovereignty of the UK 43 times. Are we ready to confront this challenge militarily? Ah, well, you added the word militarily at the end. Um, I think our biggest problem is having the will uh, to confront. You can have as much military capability as you like if you haven't got the political will to use it it becomes largely redundant. And I think that is, uh, of the two elements of NATO, of its political uh, uh, personality and its uh, military capability, it's that political one that I worry about. And I think this is where the 2% comes in because it's uh, not just the uh, abilities it gives us in terms of military equipment. It's uh, about uh, our willingness to show our longer term commitment to the alliance. And uh, only four of the NATO allies meeting the 2%, which remember is the floor. 2% of GDP is supposed to be the floor of our spending, not the ceiling uh, of our spending uh, on defense. And if you look at what happened, for example, in the, the, the Libyan uh, crisis and the campaign in Libya, the European elements of NATO would not have been able to even carry that out without the United States because we simply didn't have uh, the reconnaissance capability. We simply didn't have the air-to-air -air refueling capability. And the, the big problem with, with uh, a lot of the European members of NATO is that so many of them um, were very quick, uh, after the Cold War in particular, to get into NATO. Um, and uh, they all recognized um, what an opportunity it was uh, for everyone to get the insurance policy, but asking just a few others to pay the premiums for us. Um, and we are in a position where there are too, me too many countries taking a free ride on the United States in particular, which is why I think it's very important that Britain shows um, the moral leadership to make that 2% commitment. Um, we have given our word as a country that we will play our full part in the alliance, and we must do so. Last week I was in Poland, and the world from Warsaw looks very different from it does from either London or Washington. And there is a palpable fear there um, about what is going on uh, and the geographic proximity um, of, of Putin is getting them to waken up. And they are, of course, going to increase the defense spending as our countries like Estonia. Um, but they're coming to the, the threat late in the day. Uh, so we do need to get our, our political act together in, inside NATO. And there's a, there's a related issue here, and I know this is, we, we did talk about this at Williamsburg, but I, but I go back to it again. Um, part of the problem with NATO is the European Union, and the European Union trying to take on uh, a defense and security role. That is not what the EU is for. That is what NATO is for. And if we try to duplicate uh, what NATO is doing um, inside the European Union, and worse, if it ends up having the diversion of funds away from the scarce funding that we're giving NATO into a duplication in the European Union, that can be of comfort only to those who are our enemies. 
It's, I'm going to turn to the EU because I definitely want your, your thoughts on uh, the Eurozone and uh, immigration issues as you're seeing them. But before I, I leave Russia, I just your, your opening remarks and you, you mentioned uh, Prime Minister Churchill. And I have to say I struggle with this. What, what would Churchill say today? On the one hand, he, was, he presciently described the rise of Nazism, um, wartime prime minister to, to create that defense. There's no choice between war and shame. You'll have shame and then you'll have war that will come later. But he was also at Yalta and yeah. also in some ways agreed to a sphere of influence. We need a new strategic framework for this challenge that Putin is, is presenting the West. How do you strike that balance between uh, the values proposition, but again, the political will to meet Mr. Putin which, with strength? Uh, well, first of all, we have to provide ourselves with the capability, and we need to have a better sharing of that capability, but we also need to be willing to, um, to confront him where necessary. We, we've seen his modus operandi. We need to have a stronger presence in the Baltic states in particular. And, and let's be very r frank about what he's doing here. Uh, he's got Kaliningrad in the Baltic. He's been uh, bullying some of the smaller uh, Baltic states, interfering politically, funding pro-Russia candidates. He's been encouraging Republika Srpska in the Balkans uh, to see um, the uh, illegal re uh, referendum in Crimea as a precedent. He has still got forces in Georgia. He's created virtually a client state in Armenia. He's now annexed Crimea. Um, how many lessons do we need um, in what is happening here? This is the ability now to cause instability at will uh, in terms of European security. We need to uh, counter that. We need to have a, uh, a larger and permanent presence in the Baltic. We need to beef up the Baltic air patrols. We need to look at countries like Poland and see whether we need to have uh, a greater permanent NATO presence there. We need to use um, uh, the powers that we have uh, to show that we are not uh, going to allow this concept of a sphere of influence to take hold. For example, um, we should be uh, sending our naval power into the Black Sea just to show that we have every right to do that and that this is not the personal pond uh, of Putin. So uh, there are things that we, we can do, uh, but we have to have the will to do it and we have to have the leadership to do it. Let me turn uh, to the European Union. Um, in some ways, the May 7th general elections is in, in part, not completely, about the future of Great Britain in the, in the European Union. Obviously, you've been a critic of, of the EU and uh, Britain's role in there. Expand a little bit on what you've been watching over the last several years, whether it's within the Eurozone and how the uh, 19 Eurozone members have been dealing with a, an ongoing economic crisis, certainly the last few weeks with uh, Prime Minister Zifras has, has How long have you got? Uh, well, you have a couple <laughs> minutes. You can go. <laughs> the, uh, well, first of all, um, in terms of the UK election, um, the Conservative Party, my party, uh, believes that we should have a referendum because no one under about 57 years of age in the UK has ever been able to take part in a referendum about our membership. Um, it's one of my earliest political memories is the referendum of 1975 because my parents campaigned on opposite sides. And, oh. Um, it's a was tense a, household. It was a tense household. Um, it's still, my parents still have uh, the same views that they held then. Um, uh, but Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, uh, said uh, in Britain that, uh, and I quote, uh, Europe is too important an issue to be left to the lottery of the electorate, um, which I think tells you all you need to know about the mindset of the bureaucracy in Brussels. And in an era where people are uh, across Western political systems seem to be losing faith um, in the political system itself. Giving people a say on their own destiny, I think, is one of the ways in which you restore faith um, in that system and, and you keep faith with the people. So that's, that's one side of it. The Eurozone, well, um, uh, a lot of our European partners are now becoming uh, serial economic self-harmers. And uh, the, the whole concept of the Euro, which of course we decided to stay out of, uh, I think has been a, a disaster. Um, and I remember on the uh, night we were voting on it in the House of Commons, John Major saying to me, um, uh, who in their right minds would go into anything in life 
that doesn't have an exit. And we're now discovering with the Greek situation exactly what happens uh, when you don't have an exit. Now, the, the euro was always, I think, uh, intellectually and economically flawed. There were two basic models that the euro could have taken. First of all, to say it is so important for this concept of ever closer union, we will do everything to make it work, right up to and including full political, economic, and monetary union. But they didn't do that. Or they could have said it's purely an economic project, and only the countries that uh, make the grade are allowed to join. Well, they didn't do that either. In fact, the wrong countries were allowed to join, countries that were never close to making the convergence criteria. And then, having been allowed to join, they followed fiscal policies that made them diverge rather than converge, building instability into an already flawed architecture. Um, and we're living with the consequences um, of that today, because what you're getting is monetary policy effectively applied across the whole continent that suits Germany, the biggest continental economy. And I'm afraid that memories are too short, are too, too long rather, and history is too short for people to accept what they perceive as austerity being applied to them from Berlin. And the reason that I mentioned my parents' uh, positions on the European referendum was that my father said we must join what was then the common market. He said to diminish the tensions that drove Europe to destruction twice in a century. And I, wor I, won I, I worry now that what we're getting in the euro is the recreation of those tensions economically uh, that will lead us to many of the, the same uh, disadvantageous uh, positions that we had before. The, um, how do you go about de-risking the euro is, is for me the big question. Well, you can go back to the national currencies and abandon the euro. That's not going to happen. You can throw out the outliers in southern Europe in particular. That's Greece, Portugal, Spain. Um, probably Italy, uh, but that would undermine their uh, drive towards ever closer union, so that's not going to happen. The third would be to throw out the biggest outlier, which is Germany, and clearly that's not going to happen because Germany likes the euro because it's a way undervalued currency for the size and strength of the German economy, um, and uh, Germany's done very well out of that. And the fourth uh, way is for them, the countries inside the eurozone, to move to full uh, full political, economic, and monetary union. And I spoke to a senior uh, member uh, in Brussels recently who said, you're quite right. Those are the four options, and we'll take none of them. Um, and what we will do is continue to take the risk effectively and hoping that the bomb goes off on someone else's watch. Um, and I regard the euro now as being the single biggest threat to global financial stability, because what is happening in Greece will be replicated in the future because the basic problem is not being sorted out. And the most important uh, issue for European politicians, I think, is the de-risking um, of the euro. 58% uh, of young Spaniards are unemployed. How long do you think you can tolerate those levels of unemployment um, being foisted upon a population for what is effectively a political project? Um, uh, this is not a sensible way to be running uh, either the economics or the long-term social stability in Europe. And I wonder how many young Europeans on the current trend will be sacrificed on the altar um, of the single currency uh, before European leaders waken up to the, the truth of what's happening. Setting aside the, the Eurozone, which, is, which in itself has, has got its own uh, rhythm at the moment, are, are you undervaluing, though, the incredible benefit the United Kingdom has received from being part of the single market? In fact, over the last five years, trade between the United Kingdom and the EU has increased. I mean, can, can this, this conversation about the UK's role within the European Union, it, it, are you not completely underemphasizing the, the great economic benefits that, that you enjoy, well, as well as London as, as the financial center, which is benefiting from being within the European Union, but not obviously of the euro? Well, we were told, of course, that if we didn't join the single currency, that would be the end of London um, as the economic center. Um, didn't quite work out that way. Um, I take a, you know, a, a very simplistic view of this, which is money goes to where money can be made and money can be moved. And money comes to London for both those reasons. Money can be made uh, because of our regulatory and taxation framework, especially at the moment, and, and it can be moved because of our system of commercial law. So that will continue to make it attractive, whether we're inside the European Union 
uh, or not, and I haven't really noticed uh, Norway or Switzerland uh, suffering hugely for not being members of the European Union. Of course, there are gains of being inside it. So uh, what, I, what I would like is to have, though, is a, a debate that looks at the ledger in terms of its pluses and minuses, um, but in a very realistic and hard-headed way. Uh, Britain would have, to, would have to look to see whether um, were Britain to leave the European Union, uh, what that meant in terms of, of, uh, of our trade. Uh, worth pointing out, however, that uh, uh, Europe, the rest of our European partners export much more to us, the one country, than we export to them, the other 27. Uh, and so the balance is very much uh, in one direction. So uh, I think that we do need to have this debate, but I, I, I really rather dislike um, some of those who will say, oh, we couldn't stand on our own two feet. Britain could not exist outside the European Union, which is clearly nonsensical, given the success of some of the countries in our neighborhood geographically who are. Uh, what I would like to see is a renegotiated relationship with Europe. I'd like us to go back to the concept of a common market. I want to be able to cooperate with our European partners where it's in our mutual interest to do so, but I want to be able to keep separate the levers that Britain might need to use uh, in Britain's national interest where ours to differ um, from theirs, which, th which they do uh, on a, a whole range of issues. One political party that has benefited from the sort of anti-European Union, even anti-immigrant stance has been the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP. So I'd like to turn a little bit to the domestic politics and put that crystal ball on the table. Uh, for May 7th, we have the, the, the commentary class uh, has certainly been speculating that what we are about to witness on May 7th is going to be a real mess, uh, a hung parliament, uh, a very difficult uh, coalition framework where the smaller parties, particularly the Scottish National Party, uh, perhaps UKIP on the other side, may be determining what uh, a future British government looks like. Help the average American understand what's going to happen on May 7th, and then what are the implications oh. for, for us? Shall I also give you the lottery numbers this week? Uh, the, um, the bookies always have this right. I have to say, I follow them as much as you go. But, um. I, uh, I, I tend to go with the bookies as well. Oh, rather than good. The, I think people are more circumspect about where they put their money than where they put their opinions. Indeed. But uh, um, uh, what does look like it's happening at the moment is that the two main parties are increasing in strength again at the expense of the smaller ones. A classic squeeze as we get to an election. And um, for all the talk of uh, breakthroughs, in a country like Britain with a first-past-the-post system, it's very, very difficult. Uh, for parties to break into that. I think that, and you will say, with some justification, you would say this. Uh, as a former chairman of the Conservative Party, I, I believe that uh, when you have an economy where we have created 1.85 million jobs, 1,000 jobs a day since we've been in office, with historically low interest rates and low inflation rates, with people really feeling uh, the growth in the economy now feeding through to their own uh, pockets, uh, I think that it's very hard to see why the public would throw out a government that's provided them with that. I happen to think that the current uh, uh, Labour, Labour Party leader is uniquely unqualified uh, to lead the country in a way that I've never known in my 23 years in Parliament. Um, um, but I won't intrude on their private grief uh, any further um, on that one. Um, and I think that uh, when it comes to the election, people will look at the economic record of the government. They will look at the fact that in David Cameron, they have an experienced prime minister at a time when international security uh, is, is not looking great. And I think that they will decide not to make the change. I think the Conservatives will be the biggest party. I think that we'll be close to an overall majority. Um, and, uh, and I remember the first election that I was elected in 1992, the scenario was not that dissimilar to this one, uh, when in fact we were not ahead in any opinion polls. Um, and John Major won the highest number of votes any prime minister won in history. Um, so the electorate, when faced with actually putting the cross, I think will think very hard. Uh, as, as a member of parliament, you served on the Constitution Committee and had a great deal uh, focus on constitutional affairs. For those of us who've been watching the Scottish debate, obviously last fall's referendum, which was a bit of a heart stopper, uh, weren't quite sure how that would, uh, that would evolve, and now we see where the Scottish National Party is going to be doing, we think, uh, very well for May 7th, which may cause uh, Labour to not do as well. But what does this mean for the United 
kingdom? Is it becoming more disunited? And will this election begin to pull at the very fabric of the United Kingdom? Well, I always thought that um, Tony Blair's constitutional uh, proposals for devolution um, were imbalanced um, and would have uh, repercussions. We argued at the time, it was, it was my responsibility at the time in the House of Commons, uh, and I argued that uh, what was happening was a recipe for the rise of nationalism. Um, I, I, I didn't think actually ever it was such a heart stopper, the referendum. Okay. Um, and, and your faith in the bookies would have been well placed because Indeed. they said 87% chance of getting uh, a no vote on that referendum. In fact, they paid out the day before. <laughs> the referendum actually took place. Some of the, the bookmakers, they were so certain were they of the outcome. The trouble with it is that the, the ind pro-independent side who lost the referendum think they won and have been continuing to yeah. push more and more in that direction, and that has been a problem. Uh, it is also uh, now very apparent that the Labour Party looked like it will do very badly in Scotland, um, and I think that's a problem of their own making, um, again, in how they've approached all of this. What will it mean if there's a big SNP uh, grouping? Uh, well, that will depend, of course, on the, on the wider outcome. The nightmare scenario is a Labour for me, a Labour SNP coalition. And the reason that that's a nightmare for me is not just that um, yet more money will move from my constituents uh, up north of the border into Scotland. Um, uh, and Scottish voters already get far more spending per head than, than the voters in England do. But the real worry is that the SNP are a unilateralist party. They believe in abandoning our nuclear deterrent. They want a nuclear-free country. Um, and I wonder what price the Labour leader would pay to get the keys to Downing Street. Um, that that worries me more than anything else, and it should worry uh, our, our American friends. Absolutely. I'm going to my last question, and then I'm going to bring our audience into it. I, I'm going to ask you the question that I get asked very frequently by journalists. Is, is, does the United States still have this close, exclusive relationship with the United <coughs> Kingdom that it has in the past? Does the United States still consider itself a European power? Is it still engaged as it was in the transatlantic relationship? Or has it decided we're going to maintain our alliance, but we're really focusing on the Asia Pacific region, India, these other great opportunities, and we just don't see those opportunities in Europe? How would you answer that question? I always thought that the whole concept of the pivot um, was, was a little bizarre. Um, it's not as though the Atlantic was going to disappear any day soon. Uh, clearly, the United States does have to focus on Pacific affairs. It is a Pacific power, but it's also an Atlantic power. It's not got the luxury of choosing uh, which way to look. Uh, and global security, for the very reasons we were discussing, because of our interdependence, is not something that you can decide which geographical area you're now going to worry about and which area you're going to disregard. It's not, it's not like that, as um, events in Ukraine um, are showing. Um, the U.S. is still the global superpower, economically and militarily. With that come responsibilities. Um, and uh, we need uh, the U.S. to be in the game. So um, I wonder what signal Mr. Putin got that America was not going to be as focused on its transatlantic area, but was going to focus on the Pacific. I wonder what signal he took from that and whether that's actually been advantageous to wider security. Interesting. Well, thank you. Okay, I've given you your warm-up. I'm ready to unleash the audience. Um, if you could uh, please raise your hand. We have a microphone. If you could identify yourself, please, uh, with your name and affiliation. We have about 15 minutes, so I'd ask uh, for the comments to be short, the questions to be very focused. With your permission, I'll bundle a few questions, sure. and then you can fire away at them. So with that, please, sir, we have one right there in the front. And then one to the side and one Thank you very much for a realist view of the world, or a Tory view of the world. Um, my question follows on Asia. I was going to ask about the pivot. But um, do you see, is, does the UK or EU or NATO see Asia as, as sort of outside its purview? Is that something to be left to the US? How do you define your interest in East Asia? And how are you pursuing those? Thank you. And we had a question right up front here, Marcin. We'll stick to this side for a moment. Thank you. Michael Igo with DevEx. You've spoken quite a bit about um, diplomacy and defense and the need to build political will in those areas. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the third D, development, um, and how the relationship between 
USAID in the United States and the Department for International Development in the UK has transformed, how you think it should transform in the future, um, and if that's a significant aspect of what you're talking about. Thanks. Great, let's take one more. We have, oh, you know, right there, Marcin, right there to the side, and then I'll perhaps go over the corner next. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fox, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Major Scott Smithson, United States Central Command. Uh, real quick question, it seems like one of the emerging narratives in the debate about the future in NATO is that there are some member states that increasingly are oriented to the east, and I think Ukraine uh, fulfills that narrative, whereas others from the southern periphery can, can you be concerned about instability in Libya. How, did the United, how do we, the United States and the United Kingdom, help change that narrative from an or to an and? Great, so we had uh, Asia, is that outside NATO's purview? Question of development, which the United Kingdom has played a great leadership role in, in development in the world, and South versus East, that's a great question. Uh, can NATO do both? Do they have to choose? Can the alliance be united in addressing both conflicts? Well, the, the very first question, I think, goes to the, the heart of this entire discussion. Um, I think increasingly, you have to understand the implications of globalization. Um, that we, we can't simply disregard um, other parts of the world simply because they're not close to us geographically. Um, and uh, I think of the 20th century really as being the century of the bloc, which was defined by our geography. Um, and so we cooperated with countries that were close to us uh, in terms of uh, physical geography rather than countries that were like us in terms of our, our values or our political systems. Increasingly, the world is shrinking uh, because of the effects of globalization. And as I said at the beginning, uh, we can't afford to disregard risks that are rising uh, in, in Asia any more than we can do risks that are rising in Europe, because they will both affect us very quickly. I think politicians have a problem with this, um, if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, I think that politicians on the right resent the loss of sovereignty that inevitably comes with globalization uh, and, and therefore tend to not want it to happen. And politicians on the left um, dislike the unavoidable importation of strategic risk that comes with globalization that has to be paid for. Um, and our systems of government also, with the very neat uh, way in which we have little silos that say that's economic policy, that's trade policy, that's foreign policy, that's security policy, uh, fail to grasp uh, how globalization is developing and, and the interdependence and the, the unavoidable risk that comes with that. So we do have to, to look uh, more, more widely um, at risk and, and emerging risk uh, and recognize that uh, you know, whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. The question is how well we prepare for it. So I think if uh, Fukuyama had called his book the end of geography and not the end of history, he'd have been a lot closer to the mark uh, in terms of the, um, the world that we're emerging into. Um, in terms of, yeah, it, it is, you, ca you cannot choose um, the conflicts, this is, this is the problem with security and saying, well, we're going to reduce our spending because we think the world's becoming a safer place. You know, conflicts choose you uh, more than you get to choose the conflicts. Um, uh, and that's one of the lessons of history and we have to be ready for the unexpected. And uh, Libya showed uh, some real shortcomings. It also showed the dislocation, I think, of um, our military action and our plans for longer term political stability. In fact, really since the Marshall Plan, I can't think of an example of where we've got both the military action um, and the reconstruction and stabilization right. Um, so uh, we have a lot of uh, thinking to do there. Where does aid come into all of this? Well, it's, it's very useful in terms of being able to help out, I think in the short term, that's its main uh, value. M my own view is that if you want to alleviate global poverty, you do that through free trade, and I think capitalism has actually given uh, a much greater step up to the world's poor than any amount of aid program can do, but I do think that specifically well-targeted aid is very useful. And I don't just mean in terms of uh, physical or monetary po poverty. I think that we should be using our aid budgets to get a change in behavior and values. Um, I, in particular, I think that uh, our taxpayers who provide this money uh, live by certain ethical values. And I think that we should be using our aid budget more uh, to get a change in behavior. For example, um, I think that countries that exhibit religious intolerance 
that do not give women equal rights, that don't send girls to school, uh, we should be trying to use our aid as a lever in those cases. We should be trying to apply the values that our people live by uh, to those countries that we give aid to. And I think that there's, in the aid debate, um, it's been understandably focused on public health, which I, as a doctor, regard as hugely important, and the alleviation of poverty. But I think there are other things that our aid budget should also be involved in, and that's the promotion of our values. Uh, and I think that uh, if you go back to what I was saying at the very beginning, uh, that we are who we are by design and not by accident. If you believe that, as I do, then I think you've got a moral responsibility to ensure that other people are able to benefit from those values too, um, which is what I see our aid program as being a very important part of. Uh, I just don't, however, buy this idea that you can diminish your need for hard power by having more soft power. That really is uh, an and, not an or. I, one quick question, then I want to turn to the audience again. I've been meaning to ask you this question. We follow very closely the House of Commons vote on Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, uh, US Syrian policy has been a great conversation topic here, lack of there, thereof, or, or that we do have a, uh, a coherent policy. Was that a real turning point uh, in how, at least democratically, the United Kingdom looked at foreign policy challenges? Or was that, in some ways, um, trying to litigate the past and past decisions about uh, Tony Blair's decision on Iraq? It was an aberration. An aberration. And it was a mistake. Um, I wouldn't take it as uh, reading too much into how uh, Britain sees its role. This was a House of Commons that was recalled from their uh, summer holiday three days before they had to. Uh, people who are on their family holidays don't take very kindly to that. There wasn't a great deal of preparation done in terms of briefing members of parliament about the actual issue. A lot of it was about domestic politics, and I wouldn't read too much into it. However, I think that the damage, irrespective of the, of the reasoning of, uh, that produced the outcome of that vote, has been very substantial because I think there are two things you shouldn't do in politics as in life. First of all, don't make promises you know you can't keep. And secondly, don't make threats you're not willing to carry out. Mm -hmm. And if you draw red lines um, and you say they will not be crossed, and then they are crossed and you don't do anything about them, the one thing you can be sure of is that your next red line will be tested. Um, and I think that it's not, it wasn't only about um, the specific issue. It was about um, how many of our allies, as well as our enemies, perceive our willingness to enforce the policies that we've set out for ourselves. That's a very dangerous world to get into. Absolutely. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. We can get out one there, and Leo, we'll start there. Dr. Fox, good morning. Um, my name is Paul Tennant. I'm an exchange officer, British exchange officer working in the Pentagon. Um, I'd just like to ask about information operations regarding Russia in particular. And um, I'd like your opinion on just how costly it was to to cut the Russian-speaking BBC World Service in 2011 as, as far as I can tell, the, the only reasonable means of countering RT, Russia Today, uh, as a, a state-sponsored um, information control network. Um, and, uh, and if you agree with me that it was, uh, with hindsight, certainly extremely costly, whether it can be reversed. Thank you. Leo, you can just grab the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Leo Michel, National Defense University. Among the big defense issues that the UK will face in 2016 will be the main gate decision on uh, replacing the, the current Trident deterrent. How strong is support within the Conservative Party for a like-for-like -like, um, replacement? And very quickly, since you were Defense Minister at the time that uh, you signed the two defense treaties with France in 2010, are you satisfied with the level of British, French, uh, defense cooperation. And I'll add one more to that. Any predictions on the Strategic Defense Review, SDSR, for this year? All right. All right. And that's how you're going to end up on a strong note. Last five minutes. <laughs> the, uh, on the question of uh, uh, information, um, as well as forgetting about the concept of deterrence in general, we also seem to have forgotten the value of propaganda. Um, you would think that we had entirely lost our institutional memory from the Cold War. Um, both of these are really important things. Russia is now becoming extremely adept, as ISIS are, for example, in conducting an information war. 
Um, and despite having all the technology and all the tools at our disposal, we seem to fail to understand the importance or the potential that it gives us. So I'm, I'm entirely with you um, on that, and we need to really raise our game right across uh, the whole information uh, piece. In terms of nuclear deterrent, yes, it's, there's very strong support inside the Conservative Party for uh, replacement. Um, the biggest arguments in Britain against it um, are that, uh, well, why would you spend so much money on a system that, never, that you'll never use which utterly fails to understand the concept of deterrence, which is that we're using it every day. It's a deterrent. Uh, and then when they say, you can't really afford 20 billion in terms of capital costs for the new, for the new uh, program, I point out that we were very happy uh, to spend 9 billion for three weeks of the Olympics, but we are reticent about spending 20 billion for 35 years of protection from nuclear blackmail. Uh, it does seem to me that we want to think hard about our priorities on that one. As for the SDSR, clearly um, the next defense review will have to take into account that heavy uh, initial cost uh, in the capital program for the nuclear deterrent. Um, that I think is, is factored in, but it's, it's a big cost. And I would say that the defense budget is driven by four things. There are four drivers and constraints. The first is uh, the international security environment, which is deteriorating, which suggests you need an uplift in the budget. Secondly, it's driven by the uh, commitments already entered into, our 2% NATO commitment, our commitment to upgrade our nuclear deterrent, and it's also the gaps that we decided to take in 2010, um, but which we will not be able to take again. Uh, maritime surveillance capability, for example, that's probably going to be another billion uh, on the budget just for the one item. Um, then you've got the fiscal position, which is improving dramatically um, in the United Kingdom uh, because of uh, the long-term economic plan that we've put, put uh, forward. And then the fourth one, I think, is your international obligations um, and your willingness to have a role in global affairs. Um, and I think that we have given our word as a country, um, as a member of the Alliance, we need to keep that word. And I think if we want to be able to propagate the, the values and systems that I've been talking about, we have to be willing to provide the means, uh, if necessary, to protect them. Uh, so I can see no option, really, than a rise in the budget. Um, I fail to see how you can actually produce what we did in, in Future Force 2020, set out in the 2010 Defence Review, without increasing the budget, never mind filling in the gaps um, that we will have to because of a deteriorating security picture. Um, I think it's inevitable the budget will go up. I think uh, smart politicians uh, would turn a, a necessity into a virtue. Well, Dr. Fox, it is always a great uh, opportunity to have a great discussion with you. You've given us a lot to think about. We're going to focus in on the outcome of May 7th and see what the future holds for British politics. But although the US-UK relationship may be complicated and evolving, it's clearly vitally important. And we're delighted that you could spend some time with us. And please join me in thanking Dr. Fox for a great discussion. Thank you.